I call this our secret ingredient. It's the charcoal, which makes everything that it touches or cooks over taste better. This is marabou charcoal, which is an invasive species. It was like taken over the forest in Cuba. And then they figured that they could just turn it into charcoal and then actually like sell it and make some money off of it. These are just little like chimney bricks that we actually bought at Home Depot. We got these amazing girls were like 20 grand each. And then we decided that we wanted to cook a little differently than they were designed for. So we really want to keep the smoke and the heat like insulated coming directly at what we're cooking. Everything we're cooking all day is going to be so close to that charcoal. It's kind of almost like we're smoking it, even though you're really not. Mike, our owner, grew up over in Israel and has trained over there and worked over there. We just have to really respect the people and the culture that we are representing and then just have to be like thoughtful and intentional about the flavors and the spices that we use so that we're not just going to put something random on the menu and call it Israeli when it's really not. When you look around New York City, you see people like slanging hot dogs on the side of the street. When you're like walking around Tel Aviv, if you just look for the smoke, like you know someone's cooking and you can just go and get like a beautiful little sandwich or like a little skewer or like a kebab over rice or something like that. People have been cooking this way in this style for thousands of years, so it's really cool to be able to do that in a restaurant setting. This is Sam, he's our executive sous chef here, and he's getting ready to go ahead and grind up all the meat for our brisket kebab. We figured out that the nicest mix is gonna be brisket with some chuck roll. Let's start with that brisket. People will probably kill us if they know that we're taking a brisket and doing this to it. But it makes such a beautiful product, you know? So there's not too much intramuscular fat going on here, but when we get into the chuck roll, they're gonna see it's like really nicely marbled and just kind of all throughout it, which is cool. And that's kind of the reason why we decided to do, instead of purely brisket, to do both so you kind of get the best of both worlds. We grind the meat here ourselves because we really want to focus on good fat content so that we can spend as much time as possible over the grill and cook it basically to well done but it'll still be like tender and juicy. And we're gonna grind right onto a tray over ice. And that just ensures that everything stays as cold as possible and that the fat doesn't melt out as we're grinding our meat. So we grind it with a coarse attachment and we're gonna run it through twice. When I cut the long strands like that, we can just drop it right in and I don't really need to do anything else. I don't have to push little chunks down. It kind of just pulls itself. These beautiful white strands, that's all the fat being ground up and it's gonna stay nice and juicy because all the fat that's in there. And that's kind of the importance of using the blend of the chuck and the brisket because the brisket had that beautiful cap on it. That's the stuff that's kind of gonna render out as you cook. The chuck has all the intermuscular fat that's gonna really stay in there. So we are gonna get some beautiful drippings, but we're also gonna have a lot of the fat stay in the kebab itself. And that's what's gonna allow it to be nice and juicy. All right, so this is our meat blend after the first grind. As you can see, it's super, super coarse like this. We want it to all be homogenous so it can kebab nice. So we're gonna blend it through one more time. You can see how it's incorporating a lot better now. It's all becoming more of one thing. All right, so we're gonna add our brisket chuck mixture to the mixer. So I'm gonna grab the rest of the ingredients here. We have the baking soda, the onion, and the seltzer water that's been sitting for a few minutes. This baking soda is gonna give the kebab what we call a little bit of a bounce. So a lot of kebabs when they're cooked over the grill and all the fat renders out will actually get a lot smaller. This is gonna puff up on us a little bit. So we're gonna add our parsley, cilantro, some salt, and this is our harif. So this is our house-made chili paste. Harif means spicy in Hebrew. It's actually gonna be on the smokier side. It's not extremely spicy. One nice, even piece of meat. This one batch for 10 pounds is gonna get us about 20 to 22 skewers. We use the entire brisket. We don't trim a single thing off of it because that fat is so important to us. So we get almost 100% yield on our entire whole meat before it goes into a kebab. All right, so I'm gonna fill this whole bowl up. We're gonna put it in the fridge for about half an hour and then we'll be ready for skewer time. The high fat content here and the shape and the way that we're gonna cook it so close to the coals is almost gonna make it like Bulgarian style. And uh, that's just like one example of the different cuisines that make Israeli cuisine what it is. The name of the game with the brisket kebab specifically is we want one long cylindrical piece going on because we want it to cook completely evenly. Sometimes the meat 
tends to get a little more narrow here and here than the rest of the kebab. We want it to be completely even so it can cook exactly the same everywhere. We want to pinch it at the end. The whole bottom has to make contact with the skewer or else you'll get little gaps as it cooks and it'll start to peel off. It's also important to work pretty quickly so you're not overworking it. If you give it like too much heat or keep messing with it, the meat again is kind of gonna fall off the skewer. So it has to be a pretty quick process and we need to keep the meat nice and cold as we're going. The way that our grills are set up is we have bricks that balance the kebab on it. So we wanna start about right here to give it enough space to rest and for the meat to be completely in the middle of the grill. The fat will kind of start to drip down and then the smoke will come up. And that really gives it its flavor and its smoky aroma. Just blasting these on like, you know, a gas grill, you're not gonna get the same effect as if you're just suspending it over the heat and gently cooking it. Any like meal anywhere in the Middle East, specifically in Israel, always is gonna start out with salatim, which is just gonna be like a variety of different like spreads or pickles or like sauces. It's the first thing you're gonna get when you're dining here. No matter what you order, no matter what you're doing, you're gonna have hummus, pita, and salatim. It's just like a good like foundation. Like from there, you can have such a great meal. So we're just gonna go ahead and get these guys on here. So this is for our eggplant baba ganoush, which is one of our 10 salads. They're gonna spend a lot of time over the grill. They're gonna like boil from the inside out. So the skin will get nice and like crispy and like almost burnt. And then the inside will be like molten. It'll get like super creamy, a little bit sweet, and just like smoky as hell. You can see the skin starting to blister and like char, which is awesome, that's what we want. It's just really important to remember that we are like representing people's culture and we're doing things that people have been doing for thousands of years. Like everybody's grandma in the Middle East is making their own baba. And it's gonna be very similar to this, but they'll all be, you know, like tweaked and like slightly different. But why do you wanna f with something that's already great? They're just gonna hang out here like this for a few hours just to get all that extra moisture out and really concentrate the flavors. And as you can see, we already got a ton of moisture out of them. What we're gonna do now is peel away like the gnarly parts of the skin. Like this stuff here, that's like really charred and like probably pretty unpleasant to eat. And like we don't go crazy with peeling it because a little bit of that skin is actually gonna be pretty delicious and it's actually also gonna add some texture to the baba. We also are gonna hand cut it, just like a little bit rustic, nice and chunky. But yeah, it's gonna be the tahina, the eggplant. We'll add a little chopped parsley to this, then we're just gonna season it with like olive oil, lemon juice, salt. And whenever someone who has lived in or spent uh, time in Israel says that it like reminds them of home or like something that their grandmother made, that is like the biggest compliment you can ever give to any one of us. So now uh, this will be the first stage of the short rib prep and we're actually gonna skewer braised meat which is a little crazy because probably not many people are doing that. So we're gonna begin by curing it. So we have a barbecue spice blend that is sweet and hot smoked paprika, cumin, garlic powder, onion powder. What we're gonna braise it in then is pretty traditional barbecue, which is just ketchup, brown sugar, a little bit of water. And then we add to that passion fruit puree, as well as amba. Amba is a really cool fermented mango sauce. And then they're gonna braise nice, low, slow, around like 275 degrees for like three or four hours until they're uh, not quite falling apart, but like just nice and tender. And then we'll go ahead and skewer them up. So as you can see, the, the liquid gets like nice and uh, gelatinous from the meat cooking in it, all the collagen and everything. Mikey can go ahead and take one of these buddies out. What we'll do is we'll take these, we'll cut them into one ounce pieces, and then it'll just be five pieces on every skewer. And then they'll get picked up over the charcoal on the skewer, which is also cool because we're increasing surface area so that we can have as much contact with the smoke and the charcoal as possible. And then we'll take this liquid, we'll reduce it down a little bit, and as it's over the coals, we're actually gonna be glazing it too. It's so ancient and it's so primitive, but like we can do it in an elevated setting here. But like at the end of the day, we're cooking meat on metal sticks over fire, which is pretty awesome. So we got the Branzino from Samuels and Son uh, out of Philadelphia. We've served the same dish for two years. It's like the only thing on the menu that we have never changed. So this is Mike uh, Mayo. He's the CDC here on property. So he's gonna work on the Branzino. It comes head on, tail on, whole fish, two pounds. 
It's for two. It comes pre-fabbed. We have specs that we like them to sort of fabricate the fish for us. It looks really nice. It's very uniform every single time we get the fish. So we're certainly lucky to have them doing this for us because this cuts out a lot of the labor. It's a very intensive process to keep the fish looking so intact as it does while still getting it to look like nothing's been done to it. We check every fish for quality, obviously. Run your fingers down each side of the filet and just make sure that we are not serving our guests any more bones. So at this point, we just simply season with a little bit of salt, just to make sure that every piece of that fish is well seasoned before it hits the grill. And then we're gonna take some of our tomato ginger marinade, and then we're just gonna kind of massage this in. In that marinade, there's tons of ginger, tons of tomato, garlic, onion, coriander, caraway, and dill seed. And then when it goes to the grill, We'll put a mixing bowl on top of it, sort of create some convection, and then we'll flip the fish one time. We'll let the fish finish. We don't play around with it too much. And at that point, we'll take it off. We'll put a little bit more of the tomato ginger across the top of the crispy fish, and then we'll season it with citrus salt, all the herbs that we have in house, and we'll send it out with a bunch of lemons. Because of the fact that we're doing skewers and the fact that we are breaking things down to smaller pieces, we can use things that are typically like byproduct or maybe we get it for like a good deal. Like it's a little bit cheaper because filet, for instance, everybody wants like center cut, like beautiful steaks. So then our purveyors have the, they call it tips and tails, which they're either gonna like throw in a freezer and forget about or throw away. So it's just a really nice opportunity for us to take something cool and something that people think of like a fancy, like maybe a white tablecloth steakhouse or whatever, like getting a filet, but we're gonna chop it up throw it on a stick with some really cool marinade and just grill it over the charcoal, you know? So this is like a brand new thing that we're hopefully gonna be putting on the menu. When we're approaching a new dish and doing R&D, a lot of it has to do with what's available to us. So, I mean, we were opportunistic with this really nice cut of meat that came to us a little cheaper. We gotta think about the season and we gotta think about what makes it authentically Israeli. Like it, it has to like tell a story. That's a chermola, which is like a traditional African sauce. It's almost like, kind of like chimichurri-esque. Mm -hmm. So I think it'll be really cool with steak. The North African influence on Israeli food is huge. So this is just a puree of parsley, scallions, a little bit of oil, some allspice and some black pepper, and then a bunch of garlic. We don't want any of that skewer exposed because if it, that'll get too hot and then you'll start cooking from the inside out. But we really want all of our cooking to be coming from the outside so we get that beautiful caramelization and char on the meat. Just gonna even out our coals a little bit to give ourselves a nice cooking area. We decided to go like larger chunks here so that we can get a nice like sear and caramelization on the outside while still keeping it like medium rare to like medium. There we go. Thinking how delicious it is. We can definitely like send those out to people tonight, get some feedback, make sure everybody else is as into it as we are. And then we'll run through the sirloin we have and put this on the menu for the weekend. So charcoal is awesome, and it's what people all over the Middle East do. A lot of people will tell you like live fire cooking is maybe the hardest type of cooking, but the way that we have our menu designed and engineered, and like the way that all of our stuff is prepped out, is like really thoughtful and like done with a lot of intention. So it's basically just like managing those coals, managing the fire, and as long as it's good temperature, your food is going to be amazing. Like I tell people all the time, the charcoal is like our secret ingredient because everything that it touches just gives it that beautiful, smoky, like grilled flavor. <laughs> Hope nobody thinks that what we're doing is like too simple because simplicity is very important to us. People have been cooking this way in this style for thousands of years. Everything that we're doing, we are very thoughtful about it. We're doing it with intention.